Hello, and thank you for joining me for my talk, SLIs, SLAs, and SLDOs, learning about service uptime from Homer Simpson. My name is Mason Egger, and I serve the developer community at DigitalOcean. If you want to reach out to me after this presentation, you can do so on Twitter, at Mason Egger, or you can email me at mason at digitalocean.com. Um, I will also be doing a live Q&A after the initial screening of this presentation at the Open Source Summit, so also feel free to save some of your questions for there, or if you have some later, feel free to reach out to me either of these two ways. I love getting questions and answering them uh, to the best of my abilities. So before I get started, some of the resources that I used for this were uh, some of the Google SRE books. Google produces great books on how they decide they want to handle SRE topics, and these are a great read, um, especially if you are on an SRE team. Um, I have also pulling a lot from my experience as a site reliability engineer uh, for the last couple of years before I left my uh, previous job. Um, and also, if you really like my Simpsons memes or want to be able to use these to maybe make your workplace a little bit more fun, Frankyact.com is a great place that you can go to to get the greatest Simpsons memes and add text and create high quality GIFs. And it's absolutely great. So I highly recommend it. So before we get started, we have a slight disclaimer. Um, this talk is essentially a giant Simpsons meme with a few helpful tidbits and hints here and there, I hope. Um, in reality, uh, when I first started writing this talk, I was really curious as to how many Simpsons memes I could fit into a presentation and get it past organizers. Um, and the answer is a lot. Uh, I think this current talk has 31 Simpsons gifts in it, so there's going to be a lot. Um, but in reality, the inspiration for this talk was, uh, as I was doing my past job with my teammates, uh, you know, may every now and then getting paged, something going wrong with the cluster, some weird ambiguities that we didn't really know what was going on. Um, I would used to send Simpsons memes to kind of lighten the mood or, uh, you know, cause you know, it could be, it can be very stressful whenever the site goes down or whenever your system starts doing things that you're not expecting it to. So I would try to lighten the mood with it. Um, and eventually I kind of realized that I could do, I could explain my entire job through Simpsons memes, which gave me the inspiration to, hey, I should write a talk explaining all about site reliability engineering. And by all, I mean this much, because it's a big topic and we only have a little bit amount of time, um, but doing it all through the Simpsons. So that's where this talk came from. We're going to be talking about SLIs, SLAs, and SLOs today a lot. Uh, so without any further ado, here we go. Cue classic Simpsons tritone music as we enter into the land of Springfield. This is Homer Simpson. He is a nuclear technician at a nuclear power plant. Um, this may also have been me at some point as I'm sitting around while it's my turn on call week, uh, watching all of the monitors, doing a little bit of work here and there because you kind of do get some work when you're on call, but you are also um, typically the one who has to handle the first level problem. So you really can't dive too deep into stuff. So, and I love spinning around in my chair. It kind of keeps me entertained like Homer. So we can pretend this is me and I'm sitting there waiting on something to happen, doing my little tasks here and there, but really and truly the website is up, things are going through, nothing bad. And then pager duty hits and oh no, now the site is down and we have to do something about it. And luckily it goes down at work. So like I take first call on it, but some of my coworkers are also there so they can help me with it. Um, teamwork really does make the dream work in site reliability engineering orgs. And our, my architects and my the older sysadmin guys who've been doing this for years are totally calm. Everything's gonna be just fine. Nothing's wrong, we're okay. I am trying to emulate that a little bit and everything's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be okay, don't panic. A little bit panicky, uh, but you know, doing okay. And then there's the sales org and the PMs and the other people who basically see this as the world is ending, the sky is falling, and now the site is down and we don't know what we're gonna do. So I do what I do best. I kind of just poke blindy, blindly at keyboards until the site is back online. Hopefully not net melting down the nuclear inspection van in the process. Um, but in reality, we, we normally, act, you know, check logs, do stuff. We investigate. We don't just blindly poke. I'm, slight joke, but eh. In reality, if you think about it, that's all we kind of do is just blindly poke at keyboards and hope that stuff works. So we do that. And then, hooray, we're the heroes because the site came back up and everything is going great. And it's an amazing time. You feel good. You're like, yes, disaster averted. But then... The PMs and ever other people are like, oh no, why did this happen? We we need to investigate this. Won't somebody please think of the children? Uh, and they're right. Not not going to knock them on that. It's totally right to uh, to wonder why this happened and stuff. And now we're in an RCA meeting and we're doing a root cause analysis of what's going on. And somebody's like, hey, 
I recently read on Hacker News about this cool technology or this cool site reliability engineering thing that Google does. And maybe we should check into that. Maybe we should look into that. And, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good answer. So let's go ahead and say, well, what is, what is a site reliability engineer? And Google's uh, Site Reliability Engineering book does a fantastic job of giving a definition for what can be a very confusing term. Um, and just to paraphrase this quote on the screen right here, it is a software engineer who is focused on the entire life cycle of software objects from creation, deployment, operation, deployment and operation, refinement, and then the eventual decommissioning. Um, this discipline that you, when you use a site reliability engineer is kind of a hybrid of a sysadmin and a software engineer. They have to understand the software engineering process. They have to be able to maybe write complex softwares, but at the same time, they need to have the Linuxy skills. They need to have the, uh, the sys administration, the understanding of networking and operating systems and stuff. Um, which is kind of what attracted me to the, to the, uh, vocation as it was, because it sounds like it's a lot of fun. I get to do a little bit of everything, um, and I don't have to write JavaScript. I'm just personally not a big fan of it. So that's what an SRE man is, also known as the Pie Man, for those of you who have seen that Simpsons episode. But in reality, SREs don't really solve all of your problems. Like, SREs, DevOps, grabbing one, dropping them in a team, and going, poof, we have DevOps, does not solve the problem. Like... What we need is we need the discipline of SREs. It's actually a discipline, not just a not just an engineer. It's a mindset. And what we actually need is a good and accurate way of measuring our uptime and get, being able to guarantee availability for our users, being able to communicate our availability to our users and make sure that not only once we've communicated that, we can keep our commitments to that. So... Before we go any forward on that, we might as well say, well, well what, what do we need? Like, what is uptime? Like, if we have this kind of uptime, what is it? Um, and essentially, you know, is if my service is running and I can ping it, that means it's up, right? Uh, but that's not really true. You know, I used to have a, uh, I used to have a boss at my very first job when I worked at university that was uh, very, uh, would enjoy the uh, the aspect of going, SSHing into the Linux servers and going, look at that uptime. It's been up for six years. And that's great and all, but I would ask, well, how long has the network been down? Like, when did we lose access? When did when did the web the the front end service that was packing to, passing into this back end database when did it go down? Was the service actually up if nobody could access it? Um, or in a more modern uh, example, um, example that we deal with a lot today is if our systems are highly distributed and only one of our ten data centers is up, is the service up? If only uh, if only an eighth, say, let's just say a random number, if only an eighth of our uh, population, of our customer base can actually access our service, is that service up? So in reality, while uptime is important, the up, like the old school uptime of a server isn't that important. What we really care about is availability. Is our service available? So how do we measure availability? Well, time-based availability is the old school uh, av uptime availability, where it's essentially the uptime over the total time, and that gives you the availability. Um, this is a good kind of availability for small-scale things, such as maybe like personal blog sites, um, smaller services that don't really matter that much that we can check on, is it up or is it down? Uh, but it's not always great for uh, systems, especially highly available systems. What we really need is what we call aggregate availability, which is the availability of the su successful requests over the number of total requests. And this is just one measurement. There are tons of other measurements. But for availability in this sake, we're just going to go with the aggregate successful request over total requests. Um, this could also be negated for unsuccessful requests. And this eventually is what allows us to create an error rate, which is the number of unsuccessful requests over the amount of total requests, which is what happens when you negate it. So the successful request and total request is by far not the end all be all of everything. This is one potential availability metric um, that we have versus many. So the thing that we do have to know and the thing that we have to note to ourselves is not all requests are created equal. Um, back to the aggregate availability, just because our requests are successful doesn't really mean that like, you know, successful requests versus total requests. If we measure them all in one bucket, uh, that's really not a good idea because 
in complex systems, they're not all the same. If a new user sign up request may not be as critical as maybe a send message request. Say, say a uh, you know, let, let, let's take the example of Slack. Okay, there's when Slack has sign up and they have like an instant messaging function. If the sign up request availability is down, yes, that's kind of a problem. Nope, we can't create any new Slack accounts, but it doesn't seem like that would be super as critically as if the message send request, like sending messages to your people, if those were uh, those amount of requests were down. So they're not all created equal and you definitely have to determine which ones are the important ones and then you split them up and measure them individually or you split them up and only measure the ones that are important. And then the ones that are important may trigger different severity of incidences when they reach a certain threshold. So do different types of failures have different effects? Um, if I can't sign up, yes, that might peeve a couple of people, but they're really not like the likelihood is, is that they will come back and they will attempt to sign up later for a service that's extremely popular or extremely well known. If I can't sign up right now, I will get up. I'll go get a cup of coffee. I'll take my dog out. I'll come back. I'll sign up. I'll try again. Maybe it's done by then. There's not really ever too much of an urgency around maybe say a sign up. Um, and just remember, all of this is hypothetical. You know, there may actually be that, but for in, in this scenario that I'm building, it's hypothetical. Um, however, sending messages, PagerDuty used to send me messages via Slack, letting me know when things were getting, uh, were, were down, or Datadog would also send me messages via Slack, letting me know things were within, like, hey, things are getting into the warning range. Maybe you need to figure that out. If I can't get those messages, that is a much bigger effect because it's a potential warning sign that I'm about to have a severe outage. And if I can't get those, that negatively impacts me in a much bigger way than saying I can't onboard the new person right now. So yes, you do have to check if the failures that you are having are different. Uh, and then what other service metrics are important to take into account? Um, the number of, re of, of requests, uh, read and write times from the disk might be important. You know, if you have a high, um, if you have a, like a high database or high disk read, write workload, what the CPU is, what the Ram is at, all of these are also very important uh, metrics to take into effect. And you have to kind of wade through this sea of metrics and figure out which ones you actually want. So, I guess the question is, is that we have to define availability. Like as a, as a company, as a new startup, as a, as a person who writes a personal blog, as someone who maintains a, a public cloud, as someone who is doing a startup, what is available and how, how do we know if we're available enough? Um, what level of service does the user expect? If I create, uh, let's say I create a website that takes a big image and turns it into a thumbnail. Um, if, that site is down or it takes maybe five seconds or 10 seconds to create it. I kind of can expect that and I expect that service and I get okay with it. Now, if something did it instantaneously, well then, hey, I would be used to that. But if you have, uh, you know, that delay in there and the user gets used to it, then it's not that big of a deal. Um, does this service directly tie to revenue, either to yours or your customers? How available a free service is, while it's still very important for free services to be available, um, if it's not directly tied to revenue, you might be able to lower some of the availability on it. Um, totally up to you. It just depends. Again, my blog is a free service. Uh, you can go and read my stuff. If it's down for a couple of days and I don't notice, it's really not that big of a deal to me. However, if I'm a startup and I'm st and I have a free tier and I have you know then a paid tier and people will try out my free tier and I know that there's a direct um, correlation between uh, conversion between free and uh, event free and paid tier, then it really would be not good for me to have my free tier down. So does this tie directly to my revenue? Does it tie to my customer's revenue? If a customer uses my service and they make money off my service and then something happens to my service and then they're down, they're losing money and then I'm potentially going to lose their money because once they're done yelling at me, the sale there may might, you know, decide to cancel the service or terminate the service or not renew the sales contract. So you have to just figure out who's making money off this. If, it, if, if there's money tied to it, people tend to be a little bit more um, upset when it's not working the way they expect it to. Is it free or a paid service? What does the competition look like? This is a big one. Um, thankfully, there are a lot of tech sites and a lot of technical uh, startups and stuff now where everything really kind of does have a competitor. You like, There may not always be a very large scale competitor, but there's always something. Um, but if you're the only one doing something and you do it crappy, if you're the only one providing it, then they kind of have to deal with that. But 
if you're directly competing against someone and y'all are like neck and neck and people are like, I don't know if I want this one or this one, any sort of availability, like lesser availability could potentially hurt you. If you have a less availability than your competitor, then it's likely the enterprises are going to go with your competitor because unfortunately, and I've been in enterprise software purchasing meetings, they're so not fun. Um, the amount of availability matters. There, there's like a, a set list of things that matter and how many nines you have is insanely important. Um, and then who are the target audiences, consumers or enterprises? Consumers are people that are typically self-service and can leave you in the drop of a hat in a little bit of time. Like they can cancel their service for the month. Whereas enterprises um, typically are sales contracts and they're not as much as a self-service. Also consumers are less likely to be too much concerned with the uh with your availability like they're not going to be sitting there watching your slos and making sure that you haven't gone into breach i'm sorry the slas um whereas enterprises are enterprises if you breach the sla pretty hard enough that could imply negative legal ramifications as well so there's a lot to think about here in how available do you need to be and one of the ways that we describe that is in what we call the nines. And then, well, what about the nines? And then every DevOps engineer, every SRE, every sales engineer, every used car salesman, everybody on earth always talks about the nines. It's kind of the new thing. And as a new SRE who started a couple years ago, I had no idea what the nines were. And in reality, it's what is your uptime measuring the number of nines in your percentage. So 99%, 99.9%, which is three nines, then there's four nines, then there's a lot of nines, nobody even, I don't think anybody offers that many nines. What is that? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's eight nines. Uh, anyways, uh, some of my coworkers joke, we need to offer, uh, we need to offer nine fives, um, not five nines, which is pretty funny. Um, and in reality, what this means is how much downtime can I have per year uh, before I'm on the naughty list, essentially. Uh, if you have an SLA that actually you actually enforce as an enforceable by law, then you actually have to be very careful of this. Um, and in reality, if you do promise something, you do also have to be careful of this. But sometimes, you know, this may be an internal metric just for yourself. And yeah, there might be some yelling and some meetings about it, but that maybe not hurt so much. So say something with like 95%, you're allowed 18 uh, and a quarter days per year. You're allowed basically three minutes an hour to be down. Um, but when you get up to like five nines where you're at 99.999%, you're allowed five base, almost a little bit less than five and a half minutes down a year. Um, which is a lot. That's, that's or not a lot. Sorry. That's, that's, that's a really hard metric to get to. So, uh, it's pretty cool, but yeah, definitely that's what the nines mean essentially is that it's how much uptime. So definitely define yourself here, um, and figure out like how much downtime you're willingly going to allow. So one of the questions you may be asking yourself is, do I need another nine? Can I add myself another nine? Um, if we increase by a nine, what will our increase in revenue be? So this is a really important question you have to ask yourself when you try to do it. If I'm going to increase by a nine, how much extra money am I gonna get? Do I have accurate data that shows me that customers are leaving because of my availability? Like we have churn metrics, we have all sorts of surveys. Does this show that people are leaving because of this? Or at the same time, do we also have contracts sitting in the sales org, essentially saying, hey, we'll give you this millions of millions of dollars from company X that's very large, if you can provide me these nines. If you actually have that, then great, that's awesome. But if you're kind of trying to add another nine, just out of a pride basis or out of a basis where there's no actual you know, business reason to add it, then you may want to reevaluate whether or not you want to add one. Um, because you have to ask yourself, does this extra revenue offset the cost of engineering? So all of this extra money that we're going to make by adding another nine, are we actually going to make that money? Or are we going to spend more money trying to engineer this stuff than we would actually making money off of it? So let's just do a really quick math problem to kind of demonstrate this. So say I want to go from three nines to four nines. So I'm increasing by uh, 0.09%. So if my service revenue is a million dollars, the value of improved availability from 1 million multiplied by nine hundredths of a percent is roughly equal to $900. So we only really get of that million dollars. If we go over $900, then we have wasted too much money and resources trying to create that. So if you can build out this extra nine for less than or equal to $900, then, Hey, it was worth it. And you will actually make the money available. Otherwise, you're spending more money than you'll be making. 
Um, and then if you take a average SRE, if you take an uh, IC2 individual contributor two, and you can say they roughly make $120,000 a year, uh, that they make roughly $57 an hour when you do when you do all that math out so a nine hundred dollar budget to add this fourth nine means you really only get one engineer for 15 and a half hours before you have spent more money on the project than you would have actually making money off of it so you really do need to figure out does this make sense for me now again if you have these whole huge multi-million dollar contracts and you know you can get more uh, if you add availability, then yes, that's totally worth it. But if it's a small amount of payout for a lot amount of engineering work, you're going to spend more money than you, uh, than you would have made. And it's going to come out to be a negative loss at the end. So now let's move into one of the, the things that help us with our availability, the things that we use to actually measure and make sure that we are available and ready for people. And that is our SLIs, our SLOs, and our SLIs. Now you may be asking, well, what on earth are those? Well, the SL is pretty straightforward. It stands for service level. So they are service level indicators, which are I, which you can think of, these are the metrics. This is the raw data and the raw metrics that matter. Um, the objectives, what ranges these metrics should be in, and whenever something uh, is in breach of them, what do we do to affix them? And then the agreements, how we react if we are in breach of these objectives. So if we, uh, if we are down for more than a certain amount of time, what are we going to do to actually fix it? So service level indicators, um, these are defined by the Google book as a carefully defined quantitative measure of some aspect of the level of service that is provided. Essentially, this is the stuff that we measure. Uh, examples of this are the request latency, the error rate, and the system throughput. There is tons of other things you could be measuring. You can measure the, the number of successful rates, um, database uh, performance, and all of that, the successful requests, a lot of different things here. But these are actually the raw metric data that we use to measure things. And then next we have service level objectives, which are defined as a target value or range of values for a service level that is measured by an SLI. So essentially if I have the number of successful requests and say I want that to be in the 98% range, once I dip below the 98% range, I am now in a violation of the service level objective. And now we know that something is going on and a alert should be triggered that, hey, our, our uh, the range that we set for the things what we actually want it to be, we are now lower than it, um, or we are outside of the range of acceptableness, and now we need to figure out what is going on with that service. So essentially, there is typically a lower bound and then an upper bound. Um, sometimes your upper bound might go to infinity and your lower bound might go to infinity, but typically there are bounds of these that tell you where these should exist. And then SLAs are essentially, uh, in the terms of Simpsons memes, they're a patlin. Um, a, they are an explicit or explicit contract that uh, you, with your customers, that includes the consequences of meeting or missing the SLOs they contain. So in other terms, that means what consequences happen when you break your SLOs. So now SLOs can be break, breached and then may not trigger an SLA event because you are not down for a certain amount of time. But at the same time, if you are out of downtime for your SLAs, your customers might notice and they might hold you accountable for it. So how do we define SLIs? Um, what, and this really comes down to a question of what you and your users care about. Um, user facing services typically care about availability, latency, and throughput. Um, and the good thing, good questions to ask for this is, could we respond to a request? How long did it take? And how many requests could we actually handle before the system went down? If I'm a small little site, a blog site, and I suddenly get a million requests per second yeah i'm gonna have some throughput for uh problems and i'm probably gonna be down but at the same time my personal blog site do i really care that much about it no i'm not making any money off it this is a business yes would care about it a lot um storage systems on the other hand usually care about latency availability and accuracy so how long does it take to perform the io operation uh can i access my data when i need it and is the data correct? And is the data correct is a really big one. Um, they're actually all really big, but if your database corrupts data, you are gonna have problems and you're gonna have a lot of them. So each system cares more about certain things such as accuracy in the storage system versus throughput on the user facing system. Uh, and that's not to say that storage systems don't care about throughput, uh, but you know, if that matters to you, then measure it, define it. You have to figure out what matters to you the most and define it. 
How do we define our SLOs? Well, really and truly, we should keep it as simple as possible. Um, the more data points we have, it makes it more difficult to figure out what actually went wrong. So uh, it can obscure changes in performance. If we don't really know what we're looking at, it also might make it more difficult to pinpoint exactly where issues are coming from uh, whenever the system does go down. So we should also avoid absolutes. 100% uh, uptime is one of those absolutes that nobody ever makes because you can't make it. It's completely unrealistic. Um, we will always respond in X amount of time. Um, that one's another tough one. You never know uh, what, like who's going to pick up the pager at three in the morning, if there's going to be some other extenuating circumstances. Um, but yeah, absolutes are definitely not a good thing to have in your SLOs. Keep it nice. Keep it within ranges uh, and just avoid being too nitty gritty with it. Be cautious when picking a target based on current performance. Um, so you want to avoid getting locked into supporting something that could require Herculean efforts to support in the future. Uh, when you're just starting out or it's a brand new service and you're like, yes, this is this is running. You know, I have one microservice running behind it. And yeah, that, that service might be running really quickly. It might have great performance and great uptime and stuff. Um, but once you start adding more and more things, as systems become more complex, throughput and uh, availability do start to wane a little bit and they become more and more difficult to maintain. So you just want to be sure that when you're picking something, if you're brand new or on your current performance, it may be a good day, it may be a bad day. Just be cautious when you're picking it. Um, if you have no other metrics to go by, it's a good start. Limit the number of SLOs that you have. Um, Choose enough to cover your entire system and allow you to win conversations about priorities by quoting an SLO. Um, a, good, a good measurement for SLOs is if you can't win an argument with an SLO, it might be unnecessary. Um, SLOs should be the thing that you can use to push back whenever other people are like, we need to do X, Y, and Z. You're like, yes, but that potentially violates the SLOs. We cannot do that. That could degrade us. We have to be uh, we, we, you kind of become stewards of your platform at that point. You are the guardians that protect all of the pie in the sky ideas from the system. Cause you know, as SREs and as DevOps, DevOps engineers, if the system goes down, nobody's making any money. And if nobody's making any money, it's a bad time for the company. Now, one thing to note here is some attributes such as user satisfaction aren't really, and can't really be covered by SLOs. Um, and it makes it a little bit difficult. So there is kind of a gray area there. So just be aware that like, Again, up to our point above, avoid absolutes. There is no, there's no black and white here. It's not yes or no. It's not a, uh, it's not a binary system. You, there is a little bit of gray area here, and you kind of have to uh, be willing to adjust a little bit to it. Uh, perfection can wait, and it is easier to add nines than it is to take away nines. Especially, customers will never complain about you making something better, but they will definitely complain about you potentially making something worse. So we have a saying at DigitalOcean, and it's probably a saying everywhere, but I've, we've been using it a lot, is that uh, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Um, so yes, perfection can definitely wait. I, I was an SRE, I get it. Like I wanna make everything perfect. I want the systems to be Skynet. I never, I would love to sit back one day and just watch my dashboards and things go down and then they self heal. And you know, I've always said that if I ever automated myself out of a job, I would take that as a compliment because it means that I was able to completely automate my entire job. And I think I would just ride off into the sunset at that point and go like farm chickens or something because I will have accomplished what I want to accomplish in my career. So how do we define SLAs? Well, SLAs are usually defined at the company level uh, between business and legal. And they're usually uh, engineers and stuff don't really have a lot to say in this. PMs might, um, other managerial types might have access to it, but it typically as engineers, you don't really define the SLAs. That's a, that's a company level thing and there will be lawyers involved. Um, however, if your customers are internal developers, then it may be within your team's ability to define SLAs. The team that I worked on originally at uh, my last job provided an internal pass to the entire company that hosted the entire website. Um, so our customers, customers were the internal developers. So that being said, we did define our own SLAs and there didn't have to be any lawyers in there because it was all within the same company. So that was a lot of information and I bet a lot of people are kind of feeling like Homer is right now um, and their brain might be a little bit uh, hurting right now at this point. So don't worry, we're gonna go over it. So out of all the stuff that I've said, what should I actually care about? Um, 
This is an easy one that's helped me remember it. SLIs are the things that can be monitored and measured. SLOs are the ranges that are acceptable. Um, SLOs set expectations for your service. Other people will expect things from you based on those SLOs. Monitor and measure your system's SLIs and make sure they're within the range of the SLOs. Um, compared your SLIs to your SLOs, if an action needs to be taken, take it. If you need to take preemptive action, preemptive action is always better than an outage. So always take preemptive action when, you get, when you're actually alerted and you know that something's going to happen. Um, determine what action needs to be taken to meet this specific target. Runbooks or automation tasks are great for this. We had tons of runbooks about, you know, because you can't always automate everything away, or sometimes the automation is scary and you it might end up doing more harm than good, and having a human there really does help um, because human intervention, especially whenever there's billions of dollars on the line for this platform, it does really help. And it makes people sleep a little bit better at night. So uh, make runbooks, make tasks. Take the action when needed. So a couple of last tips before we go. Um, have internal SLOs to your team that are higher than external facing SLOs. So what this means is if you're going to say, hey, we're five nines, um, you don't really have much room to wiggle room there. However, if you say that we're three nines, but internally to your team, you say that you're five nines, then uh, you have a higher standard for yourselves and y'all will be more concerned about it. And then your customer if you do for some reason seem to dip from five nines to four nines, it doesn't trigger a breach in the SLA. How it, whereas if you didn't have this kind of like padding, it could potentially cause more problems for you. So definitely your external facing SLOs, I would highly recommend having them be much lower, not much lower, but lower than your internal facing SLOs and actually try to meet those internal SLOs. Because if you, if you use the, if you create this padding and then you don't use it, like your three nines available up front, but you want to keep five nines internally, and you know that you're not, you know, that it doesn't really matter because it's an internal one and nobody cares, and you let it slip down to four nines, well then, if something happens, you, you've you lost part of that padding, and then just don't let the complacency squash your padding. Um, users build on the service you provide rather than what you say. So if I said that my blog was up 25% of the year and it had, I don't know, an amazing API attached to it or something, and then people started using it and it turns out it's actually up, you know, 90% of the year, people will expect 90. Even if I legally say 25, people expect 90. If you provide way higher than what's uh, with what you say, that's what people will get accustomed to. And yeah, you won't really see any uh, like legal of it. You won't see any like legal problems with this. People aren't going to, you know, you, you can't be taken to court for breaching an SLA when you didn't breach the SLA. However, uh, you can get blasted on Twitter and made fun of on Hacker News and all sorts of things. So definitely be careful with that. Um, you can actually avoid this by rate limiting requests. Design your system to produce similar performance on both light and heavy loads, or you can even have planned outages. Google actually created what's known as a, uh, the service is called Chubby um, and introduces planned outages in their services in response to them being too overly available. So whenever you're up and you do a great job and nothing ever goes down, you might actually need to, uh, you might need to in, you know, inject a little bit of chaos or a little bit of entropy into your system just to make sure that, you know, people don't get too accustomed to it being up. So when it does go down, it, uh, it's not that big of an issue. Now, I know this, even to me, as I say this, it sounds really counterintuitive, but I get it. Like, I understand what users think, but like, as an engineer, that still feels a little bit dirty in my mouth to say that. So, um, breaches of agreement happen. Just breathe and get the system back online. If you're, if you spend all of your time worrying about the SLAs and you're like, oh no, this is going to happen and we're going to lose our bonuses and blah, 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 you're going to make the situation worse. And, and like, the longer you're down, the worse the situation was going to get. Get this, just breathe, get the system back online, fig, like save all of the data that you can, uh, but there will be a, probably be a root cause analysis later. There should be a root cause analysis later. So definitely just get the thing back online and make sure, <laughs> make sure that, um, that you're okay and don't make any more uh, problems or cause any more problems than you already have. Um, the last tip I have is there is no room for blame in an SRE org. All postmortems should be blameless. Um, Google does a great job of this. There's a couple of great talks by Googlers who talk about this. Um, definitely, if you make people feel bad about their mistakes, and it's not a, you should see everything as a teachable moment. 
um you know there's that old i don't even know if it's like a it's saying or a parable and he's like someone caught to cost took down the site and cost the, the, the company four million dollars and like well didn't you fire that guy and he goes no i just spent four million dollars teaching him that lesson you know so just don't don't blame people don't be overly you know just don't don't be a turd <laughs> i guess i want to say um just help and see everything as a teaching moment and everything will be okay and that being said we are at the end of our simpsons episode thank you so much for joining i hope you had fun i hope the memes made you laugh and i will see you next time okay so hello everyone i'm mason thank you for joining in to see my uh presentation um I have one question in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, I will uh, speak the question and then I will uh, answer it. So the question that I received in the chat was, uh, I am from the government sector. How can we apply this to the government sector where there is no competition and it moves slower? So this is actually a kind of a kind of a tough one to answer. Um, my just my opinion and my thoughts on it would be to um, if your service internally in the government sector is dependent on by other services, then you should definitely try to provide a, cer a certain level of uptime to the other people dependent on your service. Um, I know that without competition, it's kind of hard to like make things uh, happen, especially uh, whenever I do know that like government technologies and government systems do tend to move a lot slower. So with, with that, I would say just hold yourself to a higher standard um, and definitely set internal SLAs and SLOs. So that way you know uh, what is acceptable for you and then what you strive to get to. And hopefully um, and hopefully it will be fine. Uh, okay, so I got another question. How has SRE evolved over time? Um, I, will give a I will give a really brief explanation of that based on my experience, um, that is almost in and of itself a talk. Uh, like that's that's almost a talk of like the evolution of how we have maintained systems. Uh, but I will give my, my my experiences of it. But I do have to say I'm, I'm relatively young. Uh, I'm only 27 years old. So I didn't see the, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this brief explanation. Like I've had to, um, I just heard about it. So I mean, in the old days, or what I'm assuming was the old days, in, in the early 90s, which was when I was a child, um, and servers, servers and services were deployed to the internet, uh, there was the typical division of, uh, of like, I guess, of, of engineers. There was the software engineers who wrote the code, and they would, they would set it up, get it all going, and then when it was ready, they would give it to a systems administrator, and a systems administrator would deploy the code and then maintain it after the fact. And really and truly, this DevOps movement that we have has been nothing but a kind of merging of those two groups. Um, we have expected more and more of the engineers that did a lot of the software engineering to understand more about the system side. And we expect more of the systems administrators to understand more of the uh, software side. And that's kind of where the SRE uh, discipline was kind of born was it is really... Uh, the way I've always had it described, and I think it says this in the Google book as well, um, is that an SRE is a system administrator who was trained as a software engineer. So that person uh, would probably have a traditional software engineering uh, background, could be a um, map, it could be a collegiate degree, it could be um, it could be a boot camp, it could just be experience, but they would they would have experience in that. And then they would kind of bring all of these ideas together. They would bring the ideas of reusability and portability and all of the, what my, what my professor at uh, my university would call the illities, uh, bring all these together and apply them to sysadmins. So DevOps, kind of like full stack engineer was, an, was a part of that evolution where you know front end and back end. And then DevOps is really taking sysadmins, which used to be their own thing and kind of embedding them into uh, engineering org, some engineering orgs structure it as that, uh, as like there's a DevOps engineer in each uh, of the orgs and that person is responsible for that application's deployment. Um, where I came from when I worked at, uh, I worked previously for VRBO, um, the, we actually had an entire platform team and there were no DevOps engineers on the individual engineering orgs. Um, 
there was, they would all deploy their apps to our platform and then we manage all of the applications in the company on that platform. So it makes it, that's one of the things that actually makes getting, I would say getting an SRE or a DevOps job kind of difficult um, is because everybody does it differently. We haven't really standardized on what that terminology means in the industry. So I could apply for three different jobs that all say DevOps specialist, and it could be completely different. The skill sets that they require for each different job would be very dependent on the job itself. Um, I hope that's a good enough an good enough answer for now. Uh, how SRE and how uh, the deployment of software has evolved over the years would make for an amazing book. It would make for a great keynote at a conference. Um, I could we could probably talk about that for hours. Uh, would next question? Would you suggest you to use SLAs to measure the performance of your employees? with them being aware of it. Ooh, I don't know. That's a weird one. Um, I, I mean, in reality, that's kind of what we already do. We have a set of performance metrics that we expect someone to be able to do, whether or not they are um, deliver X amount of code, deliver this such and such performance, contribute to these conversations. Managers kind of already kind of sort of do this. Um, now, I don't know if I would go so much as to define, like, because you can't have SLAs without SLOs and SLIs. So you need an indicator to determine what is a, an acceptable amount of performance. And then you would need an objective, or actually indicator would just be, how do you measure the performance? And that can be very difficult. You know, it's really difficult to judge software engineering work because it's not like we, we can't judge it on the line of code or the number of commits because that, that can be artificially inflated really difficultly. So you would have to have an SLI for that. And then the objective would have to kind of tell you what ranges are acceptable. And then the agreement would be what happens if these ranges are breached and for how long. Um, I don't know if I would do that personally, but I would, it would be, it would be interesting to see maybe like a hypothetical case study written up about it. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. Treat people like people, not like machines. Um, machines are a lot more, I'm not going to say reliable, but like they'll, they do the same things. Like they're not as finicky. People have emotions. People have bad days. People have good days. That's part of being a manager is, you know, acknowledging this and helping them through it. So I don't know. That's a very interesting question. Um, I have no idea uh, if, I have no idea. I, I don't know. That would be really cool to figure out. That's all I have on that one. Uh, that's all the questions I currently see um, in the section. Uh, if there are any more questions, I will happily take them. Hello, everyone. How are you? Yeah. How is everybody doing? Feel free to. I'm here to chat, like, till they till they kick me out. Um, we'll give it one more minute before. Okay. How do we manage SLAs when multiple parties are involved, such as different vendors? That is a great question. So, um. What you have to end up doing is when you have multiple vendors, they will have an SLA and then they sh hopefully they will. Um, if not, I've seen a lot of business deals not make it through because they didn't have SLAs or they did not have agreeable SLAs. At that point, you have to monitor, not only monitor your equipment, but monitor their equipment as well. So like I would get notifi notified whenever AWS would go down or like when there was a problem at AWS. So I could be prepared to you know, and implement failover techniques within the cluster that I, that I was working with. Um, and if you have external vendors, you have to monitor this, their SLAs and make sure that they're not in breach. And if one of them goes down and causes a breach that then in turn makes you, causes you to be within breach, 
then that's whenever you're going to have to escalate it up to uh, the organization the organization that was was responsible. So the the up level third party. And in reality, that's kind of a managerial VP of engineering, CTO kind of discussion. Um, I don't, I would not believe that uh, that would be a normal job of a regular, like of a, of a site reliability engineer, of an individual contributor, not a man, not someone on a managerial track um, for that to be a thing. So if you are a manager or something like that, you're probably going to have to escalate it uh, through that, through that channel. And then if there is going to be a root cause analysis as to what went down in your prop, your uh, org, because this third party vendor went down, then you'll have to bring that uh, to the table whenever you're discussing it. And then one of the common things that will happen would be um, you may fi- try to figure out how you can be more redundant. Is there another vendor that we can have as backup? Do we need to change vendors? Was this was that third party vendors outage enough large enough uh, that we need to change? And if you're the one providing a service to other people then you have to be ready uh, for this as well. So it works on both sides. Uh, so yes, that's a great question. Uh, I'm glad that somebody, I'm glad that you enjoyed the Simpsons memes. Uh, I do, uh, I do enjoy my Simpsons memes. Is there a framework or open source, oh, sorry, yeah. open source tool to orchestrate multiple SLAs? For example, there can be an IoT device managed by vendor A, owned by vendor B, data connectivity with vendor C. Um, to my knowledge, and I will say that, uh, I'm not that knowledgeable of the open source tooling in this area, uh, for observability platforms. I would say that I'm not sure. I would definitely look into it. Um, at my previous job, we actually built an internal platform for managing that exact thing for managing, uh, you, you, every app could have SLAs, uh, defined. And then whenever that app would go down, anybody that had to, you could have your SLA defined, but you could also say who you are dependent on. So whenever that SLA would go down, or if you would go down, you would be in breach, it would notify everybody upstream and let them know, hey, this is about to be in breach. Um, as for open source tooling, uh, I do not know off the top of my head, but I would be shocked if there wasn't something that CNCF was incubating or had already graduated that um, does something like this. And if there's not anything, it's a great idea for a new project. Uh, let's see. I think that is almost all of the questions. Thank you everyone for the great questions. Uh, I love, I love answering and chatting with everyone. I'm glad that people, uh, enjoyed the Simpsons memes. I hope that it made, they made you laugh. Um, they make me laugh. That's at the end of the day. If if my own talk makes me laugh, uh, then I feel like I did a good job. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and give it one more minute. And then if there's no more questions in the next minute, we will end the stream. And I wanna thank everybody one last time for uh, for showing up and watching. And I hope everybody, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If not, we will be ending really soon. I think we're going to go ahead and just end it here. So thank you everyone again. Have a great day.